Well, this is the latest graphic from Our World in Data. It's good to see that cases are going down in Canada. But uh, quite uncanny the way that the United Kingdom and the United States have got almost identical numbers in cases per million people. So interesting. Now, I'm quite optimistic that the UK is going to carry on going down. Less so less optimistic that the United States are going to carry on going down because I am concerned about the new variant in the United States and we'll talk about that as well later today but that's my main concern and I'm also going to mention Israel today so good to see the cases are coming down there um, compared to the United Kingdom figures there and the reason I wanted to put Israel on there is they've got about 30% of the population vaccinated now but they're still getting an awful lot of new cases so even though they're going down slightly now, there's still an awful lot of new cases, which means that they're not getting a herd immunity effect despite having vaccinated 30% of their population. And the implications of this are fairly obvious, really. It means we have to carry on with all our precautions for the foreseeable future until a very large proportion of the population are, are uh, vaccinated. Right, you are welcome to this video. It's uh, Wednesday the 20th of January already. Uh, just got distracted today watching the uh, inauguration in the States. So um, anyway, let's uh, get on to the today's business. I'm going to start with the United Kingdom first of all. Um, so thinking about the UK, um, let's maybe have a look at some, uh, some data. I I'm really worried about the hospital situation in the UK. It's there's an awful lot of patients coming into hospital now. It is starting to go down very slightly there. Is that the start of a trend? I think it probably is because of the reduction in new cases that we've had. But the number of people in hospital now at the moment is really quite horrendous. Um, th th this, is, this is really crisis level in our hospitals at the moment. And... Uh, the reason, though, I'm hoping it's going to get better in the next week or two is, is the, the cases have been going net down now. And this is the uh, COVID symptom tracker data since the 11th of January. So it's about nine days now where there's been a drop in new cases. So um, that's the number of symptomatic cases in the day down. So we are seeing that starting to, well, well the number of cases going down. That will start to affect hospitalizations, but we've still got another week or two of really quite, quite uh, dangerously busy times, to be quite honest. Um, um, we'll comment on this in a bit of detail now. We'll just look at the cases first, though. So um, 20th of January, official government figures. Um, that was yesterday. So that was the day before. That was yesterday's uh, cases. So slightly up, but I mean, it's still it's still a downward trend. You have to look at the uh, the average over the seven days, really. So I think the trend is still downwards. Three and a half million officially diagnosed cases. Uh, cases in the last seven days, we still had an extra 294,000 cases, even though that number was down 21%. So even though this is down, even though the direction is good, We've still had a huge number of new cases, 294,000 uh, new cases. So the trend is good, but we're still at a very, coming off a very high plateau. So we've still got problems ahead. Hospitalizations yesterday, um, I think that's getting near a record, if not a record, 3,887. Uh, 30, nearly 39,000 patients in hospital at the moment. That's the number ventilated. Crisis levels, no question about that. Uh, hospitalizations the last seven days, uh, plus 28,000 admitted over the last seven days. That's up 0.5% on the week before. Um, and uh, still probably got a little bit to go yet. Um, it's not a good situation. Deaths. Now, I had to look twice at this figure. This was, this was the figure for yesterday. I mean, that was a record the day before, 1,610. 1,820 deaths in a 24-hour period is, is just a horrendous number. Um, and this is going to be maintained at high levels for another week or two weeks or, or, or for the next few weeks, potentially. We are entering the, the dark night of this pandemic now. There's no question about that. We're coming into the very worst time. Deaths in the last seven days, there was well over 8,000 deaths in the seven days, averaging well over 1,000 a day. But now we see it seems to be much higher. That was up 14.8% from the week before. 
Uh, UK death certificates uh, mentioned COVID, the main cause of death in 95,000 patients. So, of course, um, th th this is the number of deaths here within 28 days of an official diagnosis. Uh, this is the number of deaths on the death certificate, but this is always delayed. That is of the 8th of January. So that should be upgraded soon for the, what, for the 15th of January shortly. Um, vaccinated dose, uh, 4.6 million. Uh, it's coming on and uh, 460,000 have had the second dose, which of course is not the, uh, the, the main policy in the UK at the moment. So th they're the cold figures of the situation. And it, it's... Um, uh, I don't know if I mentioned this, but I'll, I'll just mention it now. Um, there's been a, a change of policy in the UK now. Um, if you're watching in the States, you might not realise this as much or if you're watching overseas. But the, the, um, the UK culture is very conservative when it comes to showing uh, poorly people hospitalisations and very conservative when it comes to deaths. So on the BBC yesterday, uh, they were showing people who were severely ill um, quite heroic volunteers who'd agreed to talk to the BBC despite being very ill. And, and there was actually pictures from inside a morgue, uh, body be bodies being slid into uh, refrigerated facilities. Now, I've never seen that before on UK TV on a news programme. So there's clearly a change of policy that the, 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 this must be in cooperation with the government. They're trying to give a real hard message. Look, say, th this is absolutely vital. We have to comply with everything at the moment. We can't nip round and see my brother or my sister or go around and see your dad. You just can't at the moment. You know, it's, it's, it's really hard hitting. And it's so hard hitting, it's going against British culture. So um, that's, what's, uh, that's what's happening. So Patrick Valance, Chief Scientific of Officer, um, also, also a physician himself, of course, Patrick Valance, a physician of some renown, in fact, a research physician. Um, when you go into hospital, this is very, very bad at the moment. These are direct quotes from Sir Patrick Valance. With enormous pressure, and in some cases, it looks like a war zone. Now, the, the, these are not phrases that uh, such senior officials use lightly in terms of things people are having to deal with. Vaccines are not going to be doing the heavy lifting. We need all the non-pharmaceutical interventions. Hands, face, space, ventilate. And we're still not very good at the ventilation. The supermarkets still aren't, don't seem well ventilated. To me, I just don't get why they haven't caught on to this. Now, um, that's the dire situation in the UK. In hospitals, it's going to stay the same for some time. And uh, it, this is the biggest pressure that the health service has ever been under. And to be quite honest, this is what I've been worried about since the start of this pandemic, since I realised this was probably going to happen at some point back in January. I actually thought it might happen in the first wave, but it didn't. Uh, but, but things are now serious in this second wave, as indicated by the, uh, the, the change in culture in the UK. So we just can't emphasise enough, wherever you are, we have to follow the precautions. Dr Fauci said we have to hunker down for the winter, and that's what we have to do. We have to hunker down. Now, other news from the UK. Um, the uh, secondary school testing, plans for the daily testing instead of isolation are on pause. So the plan was if someone in a school came into contact with someone who was infected, rather than isolate them, you just test them every day. And, and I, I, I just couldn't see this working right from the start. And I said this, oh, three, four weeks ago now. And uh, it looks like a lot of time and effort has been wasted on it. And the government have finally realised that it's not going to work. So what they've done is they've put it on pause so it's officially on pause at the moment. Public Health England, the NHS Test and Trace, who are organising this, uh, they say this, the balance between the risks and benefits of daily testing programme in schools are now unclear. I could just see this wasn't going to work from my experience in, well, partly from my experience in schools. Um, I could see that this wasn't going to work. And uh, it's now on pause and um, I don't see that it's going to work. The, the mass testing especially using the lateral flow testing uh, in schools, was never really going to work for reasons we've just, just gone dis discussed on previous videos. Now, well, I'm not quite sure what's happening in Wales. Uh, Mark Drayford, the First Minister of Wales, 
if you're watching in the States, you probably don't realise that we've got devolved government now, essentially, in, in uh, Northern Ireland, well, Northern Ireland most of the time, uh, Scotland, uh, Wales, um, the devolved administrations. And, and Mr Drakeford, the, the head of the Welsh one, said, he's, he's just said this, there'll be no point and certainly it will be logistically very damaging to try and use all of the vaccines, he's talking about the vaccines, that we have in the first week and then have our vaccinators standing around with nothing to do for another month. I mean, is Wales having a completely separate policy to, to the rest of the UK? Um, or, or does Mr Drakeford not understand that we're trying to get as many people given their first vaccine as possible? Or, or is, is, so, so there are the possibilities. Either he doesn't quite get it or Wales is going a different way. Because we need to get as many vaccines. See, see that the if he keeps those vaccines back for a week, then some people are going to catch the infections in that week and they're going to die because the vaccine is protecting people against getting very sick. And he seems to be holding a lot of vaccines back so that the staff have a, have, have a the staff aren't left with periods of time with nothing to do while they wait for new supplies. Very strange there. So I would like clarification on that. Are, 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 is this official policy that the Welsh government is going a different way? to Northern Ireland, Scotland, England, or, or does Mr. Drakeford not quite get that? I don't, it doesn't really make a lot of sense that. We'll keep an eye on that and see if it's clarified. Right, moving on to the um, United States. Um, official cases in the United States. Th th this, of course, is, is a grim milestone. Um, so Mr. Biden uh, made tribute um, Quite a moving way, really, yesterday outside the... Is it the Washington Memorial? My geography is not very good. And uh, Mr Trump, actually, on on his um, his outgoing speech, uh, commented on it as well. It's a grim milestone. It's 400,000 deaths. And uh, there is going to be uh, very bad news following shortly of another 100,000 cases that are expected by the middle of February. And that's not from me. It's from the new director of the Centers for Disease Control. Now... This is a new variant. So this Cal.20C, so that's the new variant discovered in California after where it was first identified. There's a long standing tradition of calling viruses by where they were first identified. Um, now, apparently in California, this Cal.20C is accounting for about 20 to 50 percent, of th sorry, 30 to 50 percent of the cases. Now, whether it doesn't appear that it causes people to get sicker and there's no evidence at the moment that increases transmissibility but the fact that it's become so prevalent to me means that it will increase transmissibility so it looks like california is dealing with um, perhaps a mutation that maybe arose in california it doesn't matter where it arose it was first identified in california that's more transmissible otherwise why should it be so prevalent because this is simple evolutionary survival of the fittest so the fact that that particular variant has grown to be 30 to 50 percent of the population of the of the cases tested indicates to me that it is a more transmissible variant because it's survived, it's proliferated and it's a, a 30 to 50 percent of the cases now. And the same variants also been described in those other other cases that I've listed there, Arizona, Connecticut, Maryland, New Mexico, Nevada, New York, Texas, Utah, Washington, Wyoming, District of Columbia. Um, also identified in those areas. So it looks like there's a more transmissible form going on there. This is why I'm still concerned about the the, the possibility of a, a reinvigoration of the second wave in the United States. It's still very much feasible. Now, this um, variant, this Cal.20C, was identified, as I understand it, because they were looking for the... Um, the, uh, the B117, the UK variant, so-called, um, the Kent variant, and uh, they were looking for that and they just seemed to stumble across this. So in a sense, it's good because the existence of this has stimulated the genomic testing in the States, which was rather poor. Anyway, getting on to the UK or the Kent mutation or the B117 or the 2020-12, whatever you want to call it, 122 cases have been identified in at least 10 states that I know of at the moment meaning it's probably quite widespread. So we've got the possibility of this variant, this variant, who knows, the South Africa variant potentially, the Brazil variant potentially, 
becoming the more prevalent forms in the United States. And it has been predicted that the B117 will probably become the more prevalent form in the United States. And the data from the United States shows it's 50% more transmissible. And that is enough to make a lot of the precautions that people are taking now inadequate to control the spread. It may have controlled the spread with the old variant, but it won't control the spread with the B117 because it's so much more transmissible. So that is my concern for the states at the moment. Let's hope I'm proved wrong. Um, the reason I'm not so concerned about the UK at the moment is we know empirically now that the lockdown measures we've taken have brought the cases down, even with the new variant being the most prevalent form in the UK. Without this new variant, this more, more, more transmissible form, we'll be doing really well in the UK now. It's been a complete disaster. This, this, this new variant has been a complete catastrophe for the UK. And I'm really concerned it's going to do the same in the US. That is my big worry at the moment for the States. You know, without, without this, we'd be doing so much better in the UK. It's just been terrible. Uh, so Dr. Rochelle Walensky uh, is the new uh, boss of the Centres for Disease Control, uh, uh, replacing Dr. Redford. Um, infectious Diseases Specialist, Harvard Medical School, very, very strong academic background. Um, a lot of work on uh, HIV. She's published a lot of papers on HIV. Um, right, she says a few things that she said currently deployed COVID-19 vaccine should still work against the new variants so very encouraging and uh, completely consistent with the thinking from the UK that we are expecting the vaccines to still work if they don't we know we can tweak them um, so encouraging there uh, however the more contagious strains might reduce how effective the vaccine performs so if we're looking at sort of 95% from the phase three data, this could go down. Now, there is speculation it could go down as low as 70%. I don't think it's going to go anything like as low as that. I think it could go down to about 90%, which is still a pretty good vaccine. Um, I don't, you see, there's not enough changes in the proteome of the virus in my mind to bring it down to anything like that. So I'm going to cross that out because I have seen that speculated. But it was mostly in the US press, but I don't accept it at the moment. I am not that pes pessimistic. Now, this is just appalling. Uh, Dr. Walensky expects total of half a million deaths by mid-February. Uh, so, um, reported in quite a few US news outlets that she said this. Um, well, 400,000 now, another 100,000 in mid-February is only three, four weeks away. We are looking at maintained... High death rates in the United States for the next weeks, as indeed we are in the UK. This really is the literal and metaphorical winter of this of this virus. Now, Dr. Vlinsky also says there's tens of thousands who've recovered, uh, but with uh, uncharacterized uh, an uncharacterized syndrome. Now, that's a direct quote. That's a direct quote. In other words, she's very aware of patients who are having what we might call sequelae or longer term features, what we sort of sometimes call long haulers or long COVID, um, that this uncharacterized syndrome, not clearly identified, is going to potentially carry on being a burden of morbidity into the future. Hopefully most patients were better after a month, more after two months, more after three months, but there is this residual that remain unwell for a period of time. So no doubt you'll be commissioning lots of fairly urgent research into that as one of the early things she does in a, in a new position. Uh, she also says the United States has not seen the ramifications of what happened from the holiday travel. Uh, more bad news, I'm afraid. She's expecting more cases as a result of the 115 million Americans that saw fit to travel over the Christmas and New Year holiday. So she's expecting more cases from that. Not good news. She says this will lead to higher rates of hospitalizations and deaths thereafter, which is now and the weeks ahead. So grim warning already, uh, but it looks like she's appraised of the reality of the situation. I think we still have some dark weeks ahead. Again, a direct quote from, um, from uh, I haven't learned this lady's name yet, Dr. Walensky. 
hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Right, okay. Um, now, I hesitated whether to put this in, but I'm going to anyway. Los Angeles County, um, this is the last point of news from the United States um, today before we've gone to some other countries. Uh, Los Angeles County, we know has been severely affected. We've talked about this for, must be getting on for a couple of weeks now. And air quality there is very tightly controlled. And uh, the air quality officers are lifting restrictions because there's 700 bodies awaiting cremation in, in um, Los Angeles County. And it's things like that that just really, um, well, it brings the impact of what, what, what we're going through on both sides of the Atlantic through, brings it home at the moment. Um, pretty sobering piece of news, really. Right, just moving on to a few other countries uh, briefly. Um, Netherlands, cases are coming down in the Netherlands, but not as fast as they need to, and they're still at a fairly high level. So they're talking about a nationwide curfew being instigated in Parliament. Parliament are going to debate this in the next few days. I think it's a good idea because there seems to be a lot of transmission as a result of uh, social activity in the evenings. And as of this weekend, there'll be a ban on flights from South Africa, Britain and South America. So... South African variant, British variant, South America variant, all more transmissible and clearly they don't want these. I just hope they're not there already. Now briefly, um, South Africa, um, you get a lot of different news reports from South Africa. I'm hoping to do something in detail on it when there's time to do this. Um, but let's just notice now that the uh, excess deaths in South Africa have, have increased quite dramatically. Now, this is from the South African Medical Research uh, Medical Research Council. So we see the ex this, this, so this black death is the excess. This black line is the excess deaths. Uh, this orange line is what we would expect. So we expect slightly higher deaths in uh, May, June, July. But of course. That's winter time in South Africa because it's the Southern Hemisphere. They expect deaths to be lower now because it's their summer, but look at the increase. And um, So th th we believe this is fairly good quality data on the, on the uh, excess deaths in South Africa, meaning that the actual quoted figures uh, for cases and deaths from COVID specifically are probably underestimated. Population 59 million. That's the official number of cases. That's the official number of deaths. But the, the, the number of excess deaths seem to belie this, uh, th this number. So probably not getting the, quite the full picture there. So we'll, we'll keep an eye on that as time allows. M Medical Research Council of South Africa. That actually says SA there, but it didn't. Uh, it didn't. Uh, it's one of those funny A's. It didn't print out properly. Right. Um, so excess deaths. 6th of May to the 6th of May to the 5th of January they've computed at 80 basically 84,000 so well over double the the official uh, number so by looking at excess deaths we're probably getting closer to the real number of deaths which is looking uh, to be more than double and uh, that's pretty basically pretty convincing data from the uh, South Africa Medical Research Council. And if you're interested, it's broken down into age groups and uh, all sorts. And uh, we, we see that Eastern Cape, where I've reported from before, has particularly high excess deaths. We know there's been severe uh, healthcare challenges in, in Eastern Cape. We might, we might remember we reported from Port Elizabeth recently. And uh, various areas and uh, Lots, lots of stuff on there. If you're interested in South Africa, do uh, do check out that that site. Uh, now moving on to uh, Brazil, population much higher, 211 million. Um, these are the official cases in Brazil. We know some areas have been particularly badly hit, and I, fa I found out uh, this site that seems to be quite good for getting data from Brazil. So I've put the link in there. If you're interested in Brazil, there's some. Looks like some fairly reasonable data there and regional data on Brazil. The overall numbers seem fairly consistent with the, uh, the Johns Hopkins numbers. But let's have a quick look at that. Um, so uh, deaths in Brazil, well over 200,000. 
good that they put down the recovered numbers. Vaccination, 11,000. Basically, the programme hasn't started yet. 11,470. But so th th this data here from uh, this university here seems fairly consistent with the uh, with the Johns Hopkins data from Brazil. So it's always good to get uh, data from a couple of different sources. So we see in South Africa, um, a couple of different data sources seems to indicate that the cases are grossly underrepresented in South Africa. Less so in Brazil, but we know we know even in Brazil there's a lot of difficulty, especially in the Amazon areas, um, collecting uh, collecting data. So. Yeah, OK, nearly done for today, I think. Uh, Israel, Israel, briefly Israel, interesting thing. They're allowing vaccination of pregnant women. Um, basically, there's no evidence of harm, they're saying in Israel. This is the Pfizer vaccine they're using, of course. Uh, and in pregnant women who become infected and fall ill with the coronavirus, there's a higher incidence of severe onset of disease uh, than a similar age population. So the balance of risk in Israel is considered to be less to vaccinate pregnant women. Now, we can vaccinate pregnant women in the UK, but it's done by individual clinical discretion. It's not part of the official program. But in Israel, it's official program there that pregnant women can now be vaccinated as they've adjudicated that. And we're looking forward to very good data from Israel uh, shortly. Now, just briefly on the vaccination thing. Um, so we'll probably, uh, yeah, let's have a quick look at this. So here, here's the global vaccination graph. Um, and we see that uh, I think Israel is in the lead in terms of 30% of its population vaccinated. I think United Arab Emirates is probably about second, um, 19%. Yeah. So I'll leave that graph uh, there, the links there. Just go into the description, click on the graph and uh, look, look at where, where you're interested in. Trouble is you get onto this and it's quite hard to get off. Um, it's, it is very interesting. France still remarkably poor. UK coming on. Slower than we would like, of course. I haven't had mine yet. Sweden, lowish. Norway, lowish. Yeah, there, there we go. Um, Canada, I must say, I am so surprised that Canada has not got its act together more than this. I mean, the United States is doing way better. And that's that, that was supposed to have 20 million doses done by the end of the year. And it's still only on 16 million on the 20th of January. Uh, but, but Canada's really quite poor i'm not quite sure what's going on in canada to be quite honest that's such a low level there so anyway we've got a bit of a league table here so um israel in the lead it's done two thousand two million eight hundred and two thousand two hundred forty nine vaccines that's 32 percent of the population united arab emirates next with 20 percent of the population 21 percent uh, then comes bahrain also there in the middle east Seychelles, very small population, so it's not a surprise they're get on, getting on with it. UK, uh, 4,723,000, so we're basically on 7% of the population. United States, uh, 15, so 15 million, 4.75%. Denmark, Malta, Lithuania, Slovenia. And, and uh, there the, uh, the references all ready for you if you want to review that in, the, um, in more detail. Now, I'm going to do one more thing today. I know you're sick of this, but I, I, I've been looking at this vitamin D open letter here. Um, so it's a letter from 200 scientists and doctors called for increased use of vitamin D to combat COVID-19. And I'm going to mention a couple of things from it. I'm going to mention something today. And we can't do it all now because it's already been a long video. But but what, what's interesting here is, is you've got all these people that have signed it. So... Um, You've got the recommend, you probably can't see that, it's too small, but that says recommended intake, what these people think we should be recommending on a population-wide scale, and what they're taking personally, which of course is interesting, what they're taking personally. So I do hope you got the chance to listen to that fascinating talk with Mr. David Davis, MP, who I think, oh yeah, there he is. So um, we can see that Mr. Davis thinks... 4,000 units is a good idea on a population-wise scale, but he personally is taking 6,000 units. So I just thought that was interesting. We'll just um, look briefly at, at some of the things that are said there. Um, so this is just background that this letter gives. Vitamin D modulates, it says, thousands of genes and many aspects of immune function. And uh, Mr. Davis talked about that in terms of uh, epigenetics. 
High vitamin D blood levels are associated with lower rates of SARS coronavirus 2 infection. High vitamin D levels are associated with lower risk of severe cases, hospitalisation, ICU and death. This is all based on research. Uh, in, intervent and well, correlation studies as well as um, other types of studies. Intervention uh, studies, uh, including some, actually it's, it says RCTs, I, mean, I agree they are limited, indicate that vitamin D can be a very effective treatment from the Spanish work particularly. Many papers reveal several biological mechanisms by which vitamin D works. Basically, there's vitamin D receptors in all of the, all of the immune cells. The memory cells, the T cells, the B cells, the lymphocytes, the natural killer cells, the, all of the immune cells all have these immune receptors. The macrophages, the dendritic cells, the neutrophils, they all have these vitamin D receptors. So it makes sense that they're doing something. Um, Causal influence using Austin Bradford Hill's criteria uh, that the intervention studies and biological mechanisms indicate that vitamin D's influence on COVID-19 is very likely to be causal. So I just thought that that was interesting that this open letter from uh, a pretty reputable looking bunch uh, is all there. So again, as always, I post the links. You can review the evidence for yourself. You can agree with me or you can disagree don't care really too much if you agree or disagree as long as you base it on the evidence we need to be based on the evidence right that's us for today uh, just a couple of light-hearted things to do um so um chris in dublin has sent me a couple of mugs with this uh take care refresh your air poster on it so uh I thought that was a very good idea, Chris. Thank you for sending those. I, I now have two. Uh, one for my uh, tea and one for some other beverage, which won't be discussed at the moment. So thanks for that, Chris. Great idea. Anything that gets the message through, I'm all for it. Now, that's the end of the video. The last thing is just totally lighthearted, but a few of you have, had the, uh, have asked for this for some strange reason. You want to know about... Uh, pictures and things like that for me so let's just have a look at that so this is uh, there we go this is where I do the recording so people lots of people have asked about this so that that's the camera I'm looking at um, uh, now so that that's this camera <laughs> that's that one um, that camera there well, that's obviously the uh, the overhead camera. So that's uh, that's that one. There we go. That's that one. The overhead camera. Uh, that camera there. That one there is uh, that one. That one there. Yeah, and that's basically it. And basically, I've got to remember to click the right thing. That's why I keep clicking the wrong thing because you've got to click the right one. So <laughs> anyway, that's. Uh, Few people have asked, asked few people asked to see that, so there you go. Um, yep, fine. Ah, few people have asked about the YouTube as well. So, th th this is the age distribution of uh, people that watch these videos. Um, we need to get more 13 to 17 year olds and 18 to 24s watching. Uh, quite a few of us are in the uh, older, <laughs> older categories of viewer. Um, there you go. <laughs> so that's the graph of my uh, viewer demographic. Oh, that's before I started. Yeah, that's right. This is my high-tech lighting system on this side. That was yesterday's video, I think. That's Winston, who always takes his vitamin D. Uh, now, there was something else on it. What was I going to show you? Oh, yeah, there it is. Um, yeah, that's it. So these are the places where the videos are most watched in order. UK, United States, Canada, Australia, India. So that is in order of where people watch the videos. So I just thought this was kind of nice to put on really because, um, and that's the next lot down and that's the next lot down and that's the next lot of countries down. So I just thought it was kind of nice to know that, um, I don't know, I just like this kind of thing, that, that uh, if you do watch, then you're watching with people from different countries. So... I thought that was kind of nice. Okay, um, wherever you are, um, follow the precautions. Uh, things are going to get better. 
not immediately, but they are going to get better. Spring and summer are going to be better for most of us. And thank you for watching this video very much.